it's a great honor to be associated with this institution. When I was introduced recently at Harvard, my fellow VETSA my alumni introduced me as somebody who had just received an honorary doctorate from the Harvard of South Africa. <laughs> you were going to be offended because personally, <laughs> personally I was offended because I believe that VETS is VETS. It's not the Harvard of South Africa. There are many things that Harvard does well and I'm very happy to be based there uh, for a year and I'm happy that years ago they had given me a scholarship to study law, although I couldn't take it. But I still think that that's is great in its own right, and there are many things we do better than covered. <laughs> I thought a lot about our discussion this morning, uh, realizing that I, I would be speaking to people who are not students, I would be speaking to people who Maybe students, but the majority of them are, are people who are working and have taken their time to come here. And I reflected on it. Why would somebody decide to come to Vets on a Tuesday morning? <laughs> that person must be committed to something. Otherwise, you could spend your time doing something else. Even just sitting at home in this winter is something that would give you a lot of joy, but it seems to me that you thought the sacrifice of going through morning traffic today and being with us this morning was important in your life. It then dawned on me that you must be people who want to create a particular kind of world the world that this institution inculcated in me and my colleagues when we were living here. When we were studying here, we were taught most of the times that the world we lived in was not the world we should be living in, that there was a better world, and that better world was in our hands. And that better world was a world where everyone is embraced, and that your humanity is not diminished by your color, your gender, nationality, disability, sexual orientation, or any other form of human diversity. But as long as you are a human being, you deserve to be treated with human dignity. You deserve justice, you deserve equality, you deserve to be a citizen of a democracy that embraces your humanity fully and allows you to flourish, to have your full potential released, and to live a happy life. That was the kind of world we were taught to be part of. I sense that you are here today because you're still committed to that project. And based on my assumption, which I hope was right, I thought, let me talk today about democracy and peace. Given the fact that today we, are, we just celebrated our 23rd year of democracy. We got our democracy as you recall, in, 2000, uh, in 1994. And we've had this democracy for two decades. And the ideal, of course, was a democracy that embraces everyone's humanity. And the Constitutional Court has said many times that at the core of our new constitutional values is the value of Ubuntu. I am because you are. My humanity is tied up with your humanity. 
and together we can thrive and we ignore each other's welfare at our peril. Who are we then today? Can we heal our troubled world? That is if you agree with me that our world is a troubled one. We live in a world, I thought, uh, excuse the spelling mistake there, but I thought I would say that we, we do live a, in a paradoxical time. Uh, our time is the time of the most glorious of human achievements. But it's a time when the most untold cruelties have been unleashed by human beings on each other. Just this morning, we woke up to the news that more than 20 harmless, innocent young people were killed at a concert in Manchester, England. Your first thought about that obviously is, these are cruel human beings, and yes, they are. But this was not the only act of cruelty. We see these things happening every day. Just a few weeks ago in Colini, a child died. And immediately after that, homes of people were bent down. Here at Wits, during the feast was full, libraries that had been there for years, books that had been there for years, art that, had, that is irreplaceable were destroyed. In Vuani, things have been destroyed. I could count and count a lot of things that are happening that show that ours is a troubled time. But it's also a time of greatest achievements. I thought, what other time in the world has so much been accomplished by humanity within a short space of time? I mean, the last part of the 20th century was glorious. But the first part of this century, the last 17 years, have been unbelievable in terms of what humans have accomplished through the fourth industrial revolution, technology, ICTs. We're already talking about robots. It used to be a fantasy in movies. But they now have robots cleaning streets. Where I am at the moment, at Harvard Square, I walk into a shop where there's only one person serving on the floor for emergencies because everything else you do by yourself. You pay, it's assuming that everyone is, is, is honest. <laughs> you pay by yourself, you, you clock your things, and you go out. We have and then a, a car, a self-driven car today, among other things. In medicine, this country was the first to perform a heart transplant. And by the way, those are things we don't sell enough. We sell too much of the big five in South Africa. <laughs> and, and my son, one who is sitting right in front of me, is always talking about, we need to sell all of these other things. And when I speak to my colleagues abroad, not many of them know that this country gave the world the first heart transplant, among other things. And they don't even know that we're the ones who invented um, uh, uh, the, the creepy crawly, among other. <laughs> and I could really count probably a million of things that have been invented in this country. And, but not just in this country, in the entire world, we don't have to carry money anymore. If I asked you 
to donate cash right now, I'll find that maybe there's only 10 people with cash in their pockets because of what we've advanced. So it's, it's a paradoxical time. On the one hand, we're the most advanced species on Earth. On the other hand, we're becoming more brutal than animals. How many young girls have been killed in the last few days? How many have been kidnapped? And not just killed, killed in the most brutal way imaginable. I mean, the story of Karabo touched everyone about somebody killing you just because you said you don't love them anymore, and then banning you like you do an animal. So that's the world we live in. But this is the good world where I, the daughter of a domestic worker and an ordinary general worker, found myself in this great institution, got a degree, and today, from being a domestic worker's child to being named one of Time 100's um, of Time 100 most influential people in the world. All of those things were unimaginable in the world we came from, but they're possible today. Why are they possible? Because of the generosity of the human spirit. In my case, my father having never seen the inside of the classroom and having pulled himself by his own bootstraps, had cars, had uh, built his own home, or at least extended it the, with the garage and back rooms, uh, he thought education was not necessary. He thought he did need education, but a good enough in education to take instructions from white people. He wasn't a bad man. He got me out of school after finishing grade 10 and arranged for me to do nursing, which was already advanced by his standards. From there, when I refused, he kicked me out of home. So I was on my own. But through the generosity of strangers, my first bursary came from the World Council of Churches. When I studied in Swaziland, the money for my studies and my allowance came from the United Nations. When I was here at Wurz, I got scholarships again, and I was talking to Prof earlier about beyond getting scholarships, the generosity of human beings here included an office at the time headed by Ingrid de Villiers, where you could go crying and say, I don't have food today. I don't have books. And you would get those books, you would get the food, you would get an allowance, in addition to allowance, because when I was studying here, I already had my first child. So that was the world. What does this tell us? It tells us that the ideal world, where everyone's humanity is embraced, where everyone is, is taken care of to the extent that they can't take care of themselves, but their potential is freed enough that they look after themselves and they contribute meaningfully to the community is possible. And it's possible if we do so. But what world do we live in today? Firstly, before I tell you about the world we live in is, if we want peace, we must ensure that democracy fosters the free potential and improve quality of life and justice for all with none left behind. Secondly, according to Einstein, peace is not merely the absence of war, but the presence of justice, law, and order. And as long as there is injustice somewhere, there can't be sustainable peace anywhere. You would agree with me. A few years ago, I came across a poem written by James Patrick Kinney. I don't know if any of you have read it. It's written in the 60s in America by a white, male, middle-class Christian. It talks about six persons trapped by happenstance. They happen to be just together. It's a dark night, 
it's a cold night, there's a fire between them, and the fire is dying. Each one of them has a piece of wood or a log, and the fire is dying, and it's cold, and it's dark. The first man looks around, I think it was a woman actually. She looks around, she sees someone who is not from her church. Not even religion, forget Christians, Muslims. It's just not from her church. And says, she's not gonna benefit from my log. She chooses to keep it. Another man looks around and sees somebody who doesn't belong to their race and says, mm, no, this person, this person's color is different from me, they're not gonna benefit from my luck. The rich man looks across and sees a poor man, and he says, the lazy poor is not going to get my luck. The poor man sitting across looks the other, uh, looks across and sees the rich man and says, the filthy rich is not going to get my luck, and he keeps it. Somebody who's been historically disadvantaged looks across the room and sees all of these people from historically advantaged background and says, the time to exploit me again? No ways. He keeps his luck. The last one is a mercenary. Those people who never do anything but for direct gain. He looks around and says, these sorry people are not going to be able to pay me. I'll keep my luck. James Patrick Kenny ends his poem by saying, with death still hands still holding on their locks, they did not die from the cold without. They died from the cold within. I think in the entire world, the flame of liberty is burning, but is dying. Whether the threat comes from ISIS or some other terrorists, or comes from criminals who feel they want a piece of what's happening in society, but the freedoms we cherish are threatened. Because what is freedom? It's not just the power to vote and the power to be elected. It's the ability to wake up in the morning and pursue a life you desire and contribute to humanity to the best of our ability, free from fear. I mean, at this time of the evolution of humanity, we shouldn't be in the same position as primitive people who were worried about, will I live for another day? We're supposed to have transcended that stage. But here we are in that space, and I think that we are in the same space as James Patrick Keane is called within. And among the things that we see in societies, structural and systemic inequality and poverty, with many particularly disadvantaged groups and communities left behind regarding access to the fruits of democracy and related opportunities. We see a lot of groups and communities increasingly resorting to public protest, and we see a growing trust deficit between the state and citizens. And whether it's here in South Africa or anywhere else in the world, you can pick your country, America, UK, France, Italy, you are seeing that problem. Of course, ours is compounded by historical imbalances where the contours of inequality and poverty do follow the contours of oppression and racial discrimination in the past, compounded by patriarchy and how we treated people with disabilities and extending welfare to them instead of ensuring that we enhance the ability to look after themselves and contribute to society. We're having growing governance failure, including systemic service failure and corruption. We're having growing societal polarization. Kolini is one of those examples, but 
it's not just here, it's in South Africa, it's in all over the world, the question of polarization. But also there are growing unhealthy, uh, unhealthy levels of civil apathy, where people would rather take the law into their own hands than engage with the system. And people tend not to harness existing frameworks for, uh, for the achievement of equality and with emphasis on inclusiveness. And they, they, they're taking things into their own hands. And part of the problem is what they see as systemic governance failure, particularly involving unethical conduct and corruption. Uh, and people are increasingly resolving this through the courts, but soon there'll be too much for the courts. Just this morning, we woke up to a story where we were told again, Mr. Molefe, we don't know, did he resign? <laughs> Was he retrenched? Did he go on early retirement? Or he was just on holiday? <laughs> Unpaid leave for two months. In fact, one of my Twitter feeds this morning was quite fantastic. They had a picture of Mr. Molife where they said he had this long holiday and here are the exclusive pictures, holiday pictures of Mr. Molife and they show him in Parliament sitting on the bench. <laughs> I know that sounds funny, but it's part of our troubled world because an ordinary person was sitting there those students that we've heard about, I'm not sure he adverts, my daughter Wednesday, they discovered at the University of Pretoria that there were students that were sleeping in the library toilet because they had no accommodation. There were students who would eat a loaf of bread for the whole week with water because they were starving. In fact, I, I met one of them that she rescued from the bathroom. She came to live with us for a few days. And I asked her, why would you subject yourself to that in human conditions? And he said, going back to Mbumalanga is not an option because that means going back to perpetual poverty. At least here, my hardship is temporary. There's hope that once I get my degree, I'll be fine. But guess what? How many of those young people are unemployed today? after going through that hardship. Then these are the young people who are watching Twitter, who are watching TV, and they're seeing Mr. Malefe, who government tries to give 30 million, that doesn't work out, takes him to parliament, tries to make him the minister of finance, that doesn't work out, then he is brought back to work. And the narrative moves from resigned, holiday, And uh, an American judge, Judge Brandes, once said that when the state becomes the chief criminal, it gives people permission to engage in lawlessness. Thank you. So going today, what really do we need to address these challenges? Former President Nelson Mandela once said that, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but the one who conquers that fear. What is the challenge today? Is if you know what's right, do what's right. How many of us have protested about what's happening? I have nothing against Mr. Mulife. All that they need is to go through a disciplinary process and find out was the state catch or not. Has he given all of those deals to, to the Gupta family? Is he a Gupta man? I wouldn't even say Gupta. I know people keep saying Gupta, but I think the EFF has gotten it better. They say Zupta. Because, <laughs> no, because all of those contracts are not going to the Guptas, seriously. All of those contracts are going to Ofbay and other companies that are co-owned by President Zuma's son and the Guptas. So you're limiting the scope if you're saying it's for the benefit. You basically say South Africa's employee number one is failing to investigate whether or not his son 
is involved in using that power given to South Africa employee number one to benefit himself dishonestly? That's the big question that we're facing today. But the issues of Mr. Malefe may appear to be funny. They're not funny because people will look at what's the formula? How do I stop starving? I need to find my way into the state. I need to find my way to, uh, to the networks that are in power and then I'll get a piece of the pie. I can do that in a school governing body. I can do that in a university board. If there's a university board, I can do that in local government. Soon you'll have a system where people are gonna say, if you can't beat them, you join them. And then it's not possible for us to get a handle on all of this. And for us, having worked as a power protector for many years, I discovered that we really do need to change the, le the leadership paradigm in our country. Firstly, we need to see everyone as a leader from a little child at preschool, or even before preschool, to the president. We need everyone to see themselves as an appropriate leader, knowing that what they do and say influences other people to do and say that. What they fail to do and fail to say influences other people in a particular direction. So it's not by accident that we, have, we are in this world where, the, where the, the emerging public narrative are alternative truths. We haven't called it an alternative truth in this country, but what is unfolding at ESCOM right now is a classical case of alternative truths. But it didn't start with ESCOM. It started with Nganza, it started with Midval, it started with those cases, those uh, subs cases, where things were done outside the system in pursuit of personal gain, and maybe society did not resist hard enough. Because if people push boundaries, and we don't push back hard enough to reset the boundary where they are, they just keep pushing, they just keep pushing until there's more space for them, and less space for us and doing good. I can talk to you about some of the cases that I've discovered. So what has gone wrong? Ethics. What has gone wrong is purpose-driven leadership. What has gone wrong is impact. People considering the impact of their decision. Take ESCOM again. Has anybody thought what would be the impact of that reasoning? Because people see and people do. Should people in our municipalities do the same? The president had a duty in terms of section 195 of the constitution as interpreted by the court in the case of Kumalo versus MEC for Education, Guazulu Natal, to investigate the allegations of state capture. It doesn't matter whether they're state capture or not. It's a serious allegation of tenders, of contracts, of um, licenses being siphoned to the Gupta Zuma families, of these families being unlawfully and corruptly involved in firing of the Minister of Finance in 2015 and hiring another <coughs> Minister of Finance in hiring of many other ministers and DJs. These are serious allegations. Our president had a duty to investigate this. He didn't do so. The matter then was brought to the power protector in terms of the executive member's ethics act, which compelled the power protector to investigate. As power protector investigated, the matter is now in court. The president tells the country, I outsourced the investigation by making a report that says, a commission of inquiry should continue this investigation. This is the president who knows that. When I started this investigation, I requested additional resources. 
And the letter specified that this investigation is very complex. It requires a commission type investigation. And we asked for three million, which we didn't get. And as we were investigating, we realized that even if we got the three million, it would not have been enough. The letter is complex, and the allegations have a threat of poisoning the waters in terms of public trust. I concluded as a perpetrator that the best way to deal with this investigation was an open and transparent process <coughs> under a commission of inquiry. Incidentally, in America, after similar shenanigans and confusion about whether or not the, the Russian matter should be investigated, they arrived at the same conclusion that the best way is to have an open and transparent process. And hired a special prosecutor. It's just logical that what's, there's so much at stake, there's so much distrust, you want to restore order. It may well be by miracle or some sort, there'll be a finding that there was no state capture. <laughs> but we'll never know unless that commission of inquiry takes place. <coughs> Why am I bringing this case? I'm bringing this case to say to us, to you, as dreamers of the South Africa we hoped for, that the South Africa of our dreams is in our hands. But this is not the South Africa of our dreams. What's unfolding is South Africa derailed. But the kind of leadership we want, that I said is from preschool to president, where the leaders are ethical, purposeful, impactful, or impact away, and committed to service. That kind of leadership is required of all of us. If South Africa derailed, is to be stopped right now. Me and you are the ones who have to get on that train of epic leadership, of being ethical, purpose-driven, impactful, and committed to service. In our own spaces, when we make decisions, we have to think about these things where we can make sure that there is no social injustice, where we can make sure that we don't uh, shortchange people who are not aware, or that they're being shortchanged, whether we're employers, whether we're insurance, whether we're banking industry, or we are building uh, um, public stadiums. Whatever we do, let's make sure that we do it with integrity. When we've played our part in advancing our own lives, advancing our people, and not shortchanging <coughs> others, Let's hold others accountable, particularly government. And the rest of the world has seen that it's important that we restore justice in this world and we ensure social justice. Among some of the frameworks is our own national development plan. It talks about social justice, it talks about good governance, it talks about arresting corruption, it talks about all of us playing our part in creating the South Africa of our dreams. The same thing is in Agenda 2063. In fact, the first review of Agenda 2063 is supposed to be in, 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 in 2023, which is just across. There's lots we are supposed to achieve in terms of poverty, in terms of reducing uh, inequality. And in, in this continent, 70% of our people are young people. 70% are young people under 30, according to the World Economic Forum and most of us are unemployed. That's a serious indictment. <coughs> but what can we do? The question is what can we do? I said we can hold the state accountable. One of the things that, that I think we should, we should do though is find a way to bridge the gap when it comes to inequality and poverty. And the greatest cry, I know you already, all of us alumni of BERTS, I know we already support academic institutions, and I know you already are contributing, but it would seem to me that one of the greatest calls right now is to find a way to make sure that everyone who deserves to be at a university gets into university. 
smaller states have done that. We can't wait for government, though. It's some state government should come to the party, but it's in all in our interest to use the law in our hands to make sure that nobody who qualifies to be at a university is kicked out for financial reasons. We also have the power to make sure that once people are at university, there's a system that makes sure that they're not desperate and destitute. I know here at first there's a feeding scheme, that's a great starting point. But we can meet the university halfway by doing more than that. From my side as a pub protector, apart from the fact that I've got two children who are still at university themselves, I am putting my nephew through university. I'm putting three of his sisters through high school. I have started a foundation, a Tulema Donsela Foundation, where I put about 20% of my gratuity when I left as a pub protector into that foundation, which is part of our project is to advance communities, is to build community leaders who firstly develop themselves and make sure they're not a burden to humanity. Secondly, they develop their communities. And thirdly, they hold other people accountable. And part of our premier projects is to make sure that nobody who's a graduate calls themselves unemployed. So that's one of our projects. We can tell more, you more about it. My children are also volunteers at the foundation. They can tell you more, but that's the project. We already have a Canadian lady who's gonna assist us with some of the, of, of, of the work that the, the, the graduates are going to do. We have a two-stream approach. The one is get them to be IBOs, that is independent business owners. Train them in a particular skill, give them credit, I mean, give them business cards, give them computers, but when I spoke at the Harvard, uh, uh, Harvard Women's Leadership, we said, okay, they now have a computer, they now have business cards, they now have been trained to be IBOs, they have the skills of project management, professional management, etc. But where are you going to, where are they going to get the airtime? And they said, okay, I'm gonna approach Corporate South Africa and see whether Corporate South Africa is gonna give them airtime. And then somebody said, they're going to approach, approach the Gate Foundation for me to see if we, we're going to get airtime thing. Then a, another person came back and said, what about infrastructure? And not every village has infrastructure. And we said, OK, we'll see what we can do about that. And the third one, can we make sure that they have electricity? Because to charge the computer, you need some electricity. And again, there are easy ways of advancing electricity these days uh, with um, uh, uh, using uh, alternative energies. But we're not gonna go into the, our pilot group will be the group that needs uh, less resources so that we make sure that we can test if the system can work. The other group is something that we've just started thinking about is get people to give a year of their life to community service. That was not my idea, it came from a young person white young male person by the name of Michael, who suggested one of the ways to bridge the racial gap in South Africa is to have a community service program, where people go to a serve at a community of people that don't look like them, don't talk like them, because in that process, they'll learn to embrace the humanity of others. And the people in that community would learn to also to embrace the humanity of people that look like these volunteers. And that's another part of the program that we're going to pilot at the Tumor Foundation. I've spoken a lot. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the great work that you're doing. Honestly, dear colleagues, the world of our dreams, the South Africa of our dreams, lies in our collective hands. Thank you.